Hello, Kathy Frey here, and welcome to this week's Maternity Natural Health webinar. Um, and uh, I can see that we've people are just starting to sign in, so we'll give you guys all a few minutes. And um, that's wonderful. Just a reminder, as you sign in, to um, go into the chat and uh, do let us know where you are in the world and what your role is. That would be great. And um, Brilliant. And we've got Sarah Assay here today. Have a wave, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> and um, I'm very excited to have Sarah here because um, I think I think we're like sisters from a different mister, really. Um, we get on quite well. <laughs> and so how are we going with the signings in? Yeah, that's wonderful. So yeah, those of you who are still signing in, um, do... Uh, let us know whereabouts you are in the world and your role. That would be wonderful. Okay. So Sarah is um, a serial entrepreneur, which I love her description, which is just means she just has a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. And there's always a million things going on and she's got a million ideas and it's just wonderful. Um, and But on top of that, she's got a very persistent passion for birth and the whole industry around birth. Um, and uh, her background, which um, she'll probably explain to you, is in filmmaking um, and web design, event coordination, hospitality hospitality, marketing, interior design. Um, so she's got multiple different businesses that she's built up. Um, but uh, she is also the host of Empowering Fearless Birth, which is Utah's largest and longest running um, pregnancy and birth conference and expo. So um, yeah, really interesting stuff there. And uh, she also um, is um, got a new venture which we're very excited about called Birth Circle um, which is going to be a comprehensive international resource for independent birth workers and for pregnant mothers alike um, and yeah so and she's also the mother of four children so squeeze that one in amongst it all but yeah so welcome welcome Sarah. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And I met Kathy on my podcast. I host a podcast for Circle. And uh, wow, I think after we finished ep recording our episode, we stayed up another three hours. Well, it was like midnight for me. Right? It was, yeah. We, we just carried on chatting. So we were on the same page on so many things. It is so exciting to hear what birth communities all over the world are doing to improve birth outcomes change family trees so we we really enjoyed connecting yeah we really really did so look tell us um you know what tell us more about what birth circle does what are sure. they, what do you guys do yeah so um as you mentioned before we started empowering fearless birth which is just a conference and expo here in utah and we realized even before covid we realized that the conference expo model was hard because um we had it every year and we would miss people they would they would not be in town or they wouldn't be pregnant at that time or the wrong stage of pregnancy and so we would miss a lot of people and we would have our providers come together and create these resources, but then most women would miss out on it. So we decided to form Birth Circle, um, which is an online format. And we, the, the birth community here in Utah, U USA is very strong and we have um, incredible laws. Utah is one of two states in the country where basically any type of midwifery is legal and accepted. And so we have lay midwives, certified midwives, um, professional direct entry midwives, CNMs, the entire gamut. And so our birth community here in Utah is very creative, willing to explore all sorts of <laughs> different, whether you want one side of the extreme or the other, it's very accepted here. Um, and so it was, it's naturally a great place to build a tech company called Birth Circle. And Birth Circle is um, a social media platform that connects independent birth workers to the moms who need nuanced information. So we say, whether you want a birth with the dolphins or you want a C-section with a tummy tuck, you deserve to have every single option, um, all of the information, the, the do's and don'ts, the ins and outs of every single option available to you. And so what Birth Circle does is it allows these independent birth workers to create 
profiles and basically spaces on the web where they can create this um, specialized content and it won't be buried in social media or on Google. It lives there. So if somebody wants to search um, how to give birth while um, my partner is deployed with the military, they can search and find articles about building support systems for their unique needs. Does that make sense? So yeah. we've never lived in a more powerful time to make changes in the birth industry and to mm. correct a lot of the ways the birth has gotten kind of skewed off track the last few hundred years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks to mod I mean, modern medicine is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for all the advances. But there are a lot of ways where we need to get back on track. Yeah, that's right. We've got, got to that place where the amount of intervention that's becoming routine is not producing better results. Exactly. It's making worse. So yeah, we, we, you know, we did fantastic improvements, particularly uh, for our premature babies. Yep. You know, and, and that's uh, the outcome for prematurity of birth is just drastically improved. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, that's a whole other topic, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. So what caused you to realize that the independent birth industry was just in such dire need of business help? Yeah, okay, so this is a good point. Um, so there are, in my mind, this is how I separate them. There are two types of birth workers. There are birth employees. They work for hospitals. These are the those. These are employed by hospitals, or they work in group project um, groups where group practices where it, the rules and policies are pretty rigid. So they have a, a great impact on how birth is doing is done, but they don't often use their position to change birth the way some of us mm -hmm. would like to see it changed. And there are so many good doctors and nurses. There's This is not a disparaging comment at all. It's just by very nature of being an employee and being part of a larger organization, they can't really move a lot of, make a lot of movement from within the organization. So um, Birth Circle is focused more on independent birth entrepreneurs. So these are doulas, midwives, IBCLCs, massage therapists, anybody who works with a pregnant woman um, before or after her baby that doesn't work under basically insurance, doesn't work for, for a larger organization and has a lot of freedom in choices and how they pick, um, you know, what they, what, how they practice. And the problem that we see is um, <laughs> as we started Birth Circle and started marketing to professionals and getting them, welcoming them into our community, we found that the statistics were dismal. Even here in mm -hmm. Utah, they were dismal. Of those who get training, those who actually go into practice, I mean, very few that actually get training get into practice. And then of those that actually start a practice, about 60% are out of business within the first 18 months. And that was that was, we thought, well, maybe it's just Utah, but as we expanded into the nation, we found this was true. And as I've talked to you, it sounds like this is happening as well in New Zealand. And what's well, the problem is-, is Yeah, that New Zealand has a little bit of a unique situation that there is a, a fairly easy way for uh, women to uh, source their um, independent midwives, but we do definitely have a, an issue of our independent or self-employed midwives getting burnt out because yeah it's burnout yeah. and this yeah. is also doulas and other like ibc's and doulas have a harder time getting traction from the get-go mm. midwives are a little bit more in demand and anyway so um so they when when you come out of medical school or some of these big uh training programs you have jobs waiting for you and then you you go right into the job with benefits and there's a lot of financial security but as a birth entrepreneur there's nothing there there's nothing there. Yeah. And so not yeah. only are and on you... top of that, um, you know, I remember discussing that with you. And one of the things that um, I personally thought was kind of nuts was that in all of my time at university, learning to become a midwife and know it with the industry, knowing that, you know, some of you will be core or shift working midwives and some of you will be caseloading but we never sat down at any point with a bookkeeper or an accountant as part of our education to learn how to be self-employed yeah um, and so for me personally I had already been self-employed for a long time so the whole tax structure and GST and exactly and, and, and all of these things didn't phase me but I know that for a lot that's a huge mm -hmm. part of just that being the entrepreneur and being responsible you know for running a set of books and and mm -hmm. all of that so it's kind of crazy that 
we didn't get that training, which you would think would be an important piece of it. You would think, you would think. But but the other thing I think uh, is is kind of a funny play here is that we feel that the universe had, has called us to this work. Mm. And then we get confused when the universe doesn't like endow us with business savvy. And it, uh-huh. it's like, it's, 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 so you know, we're kind of asking a lot of the universe, don't you think? So <laughs> yeah. it's okay because the universe does provide what we need. And that's what we try at Birth Circle to provide that business support so that when you come home after a birth or, or, seeing 16 <laughs> nursing mamas in one day that that your business that your website's running your social media is running things that that are, can be a drag when you're fo- you just want to focus on your client you just want to focus on making the the world a better place and all this businessy stuff is just kind of a drag so the other reason it's really really important to keep birth workers in business independent birth workers is because they are the ones that have the most impact on change. So mm. a doctor who sees a client uh, for five minutes every appointment, he has, I mean, he has, he, she, they have an immense uh, hmm, opportunity to create a, a bad birth. But in five minutes, how do they create a positive, a, an extremely positive um, experience? Like, like in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. In five minutes. So even if they are a very good doctor and they don't and the, the birth is neutral, mm-hmm. a midwife being able to spend an hour with her clients and teach them about nutrition and work through childhood traumas and help them negotiate relationships with their spouse and other siblings, this, this has a greater impact on the family tree, on the outcomes for this mom and baby and the rest of the family for generations. But if she goes out of business, if the doulas go out of business too quickly to become, and and they don't ever become these sage um, older sisters, these guides, then we're relying on an establishment that is not set up for individual care. It's it's set up Mm -hmm. to get babies out and healthy babies, the only thing that matters. And again, this is not how, I mean, doctors are not evil. Hospitals not, are not evil, but this is just the general thing that the establishment doesn't see birth as an emotional life event. It doesn't mm-hmm. see it as the opportunity is for families to heal. I mean, I say that like your whole entire being is split open at birth, whether you like it or not, and all your stuff, whether you like it or not, comes out and it's, it's an incredible, you can heal more in a beautiful, strong, empowering, supported birth than you can heal in years of therapy is what I've seen from my oh, personal yeah, totally agree. Yes. experience with clients. Absolutely. So, so these the, doulas the and midwives. transformation when you, you know, you, you can have a, a new client come in and, and the, you know, the midwives and doulas know that where, oh, there's, there's a lot of baggage and there's a lot of hangups, there's a lot of insecurities. And, and then by the end of that process, you know, they've become this empowered woman who loves herself, loves your baby, loves your baby, loves her role. And yeah. Um, yeah, when she's given that support. So what do you think is the cause of the lack of cohesion in the sort of current independent area of, of birth in that industry? Well, uh, there are a couple of, of things that are wrong with the current situation one is we just talked in depth is that the transition the turnover period is just too fast there's just too many people coming in i mean they haven't even got to the point of being able to catch a second baby with right some of them yeah yeah Yeah. they've already Um, gone out of business yep yep i love i love it when a midwife can like deliver an entire sibling group you know oh it's so cool (laughs) yeah it's so fun and they get to really know the family uh but the other thing is that we've spent so much time um and I'm speaking from kind of a young and because I wasn't really conscious in the 80s, but we've spent a lot of time agitating for just basic, simple rights. I mean, how many midwives spent jail time in the 70s, 80s, 90s even um, to fight for the rights we have now um, in the United States, especially? And so if these midwives... Yeah, and I mean, those fights are still going on. It, it, yes, it, they it, are. They yeah, are, I mean, but even and the, there's quite a difference um, even just between, say, for example, New Zealand and Australia, where in New Zealand home birth is, is welcomed and in Australia mm-hmm. it's, they're trying to make it illegal. And you know, we're only what we call over the ditch from each other. So um, it, it's crazy that there is this continued need for this fight. Yeah, yeah. It makes no sense. The other thing is, and I, I but I understand because if you've spent your entire 20, 30-year-old career agitating for basic rights 
then you're going to be a little protective of your turf and you're going to be a little bit like, right? So yeah. the other problem we see less and less and less, thank goodness. I've been in the birth industry for about 10 years and I've seen a, a marked decrease here in Utah of birth professional hazing, where you have to basically basically cower to the almighty mentor proctor and do all sorts of terrible things to earn your right to be called a midwife. And the practice of, of training of hazing is, is lessening. I mean, <laughs> it happens. And it's one of those causes of burnout. And, and one of the things that, that most disturbs me about this trend is that all we're doing is passing trauma. All yeah. we're doing is taking, well, I had it hard. So you need to have it hard because that's how we do things around here. But many younger midwives in their late 20s, early 30s are, are, are completely ignorant of what happened in the 80s. I mean, they're not ignorant, but they didn't experience the 80s and 90s. So they're yeah. coming in with a very collaborative approach. Um, and that is helping that that is helping so much create communities. Because right now, if yeah, it's just we're getting into every that woman millennial... first herself. Yeah, the, the millennial inclusive thought rather than the sort of old school, I'm God kind of yeah yeah rigidity yeah 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 so what do you see independent birth workers doing or not doing that causes them to fail so quickly <laughs> well part of it is you know being surprised when the universe doesn't hand you a business degree at the same time <laughs> as right. it hands yeah. your passion I mean that's right. just that just surprises yeah. people um so that's one thing is um I liked I like my mantra is to fail faster. I mean, if something doesn't work, figure out something that works better, faster. You know, Thomas Edison said, I didn't find, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just found a thousand ways the light bulb didn't work, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that birth workers, um, there's already so much passion tied up and so, so much importance to this work that they, there's not a lot of energy to then spend on figuring out the business problems. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I think they, birth workers don't give themselves enough time don't don't reach out to find the right resources or even resources at all they just they kind of give up and it's so sad because i don't see any other industries where this happens you don't see teachers get into their first year of school and say wow kindergartners stink maybe i shouldn't do you know be a teacher they they like plow through right like they find resources they they form unions they form coalitions they help each other and birth workers for some reason feel like they have to just go at it alone so i think that's one thing that makes makes it really hard for independent yeah, birth and workers I think part of that can be in a way that you, you, there can be a feeling of that you're competing for the business so that's a really good point. Yeah. But there in, in the United States alone, there are four million women giving birth every year. Uh doesn't sound like very much competition to me when you think how many doulas could actually, I mean, really, how many births can one person really take? Yeah. Really. If so you're not I think a hospitalist. That, that obviously would really be impacting, you know, in a geographical situation. Are you in an area where there's like loads of independent midwives? Yes. Are you in, in an area where there's hardly any? So you kind of, and then you can be yeah. that burnout because you're like the only midwife in this rural location and yes. you do this crazy that, amount of driving. Um, yeah, so it's hard a to find that balance. That's a very different challenge than those, of course, in the city, which, which reminds me mm. of another problem that people do. Women, sorry, birth workers come in and they just say, okay, I want to empower birth. And first of all, I slap them. Don't use the word empower. It's too overused. Figure out a different word, but they just want to empower birth. They just want to make birth better, right? That's yeah. all they want to do. And they believe everyone deserves a, a good birth, but you realistic, realistically cannot serve everyone. And one of my favorite examples I tell is I was mentoring two doulas together and um, they're like, we both, we just all birth, all birth. I'll take any client. And I said, will you really take any client? And one, and one doula said, well, actually my heart is really with uh, teenage moms who've been, who become pregnant under duress, are, are negotiating a tumultuous relationship with the baby's dad. Maybe they're being kicked out from their family. Like it's pretty hard to be a pregnant teenager, right? Mm -hmm. I want to help them through that. And and the other and the other doula said, oh, wow. Yeah, I want to focus on women who've had traumatic fertility journeys, like who've lost babies at, you know, 37 weeks, that that kind of like awful traumatic fertility journeys. And they kind of looked at each other and they're like, hmm, we can't serve each other as clients. 
And I said, no, and your website and your social media and the way you present yourself is going to be completely different. And so that's another mistake I think birth workers make is not giving themselves permission to niche down. Um, I know a doula here that serves basically only women who have gestational diabetes because she is equipped. She has diabetes herself. She is able to actually monitor blood sugars during labor so that somebody with diabetes, even type one diabetes can attempt a home birth or a birth center birth because she's there helping to monitor their blood sugar. And it's just like, what a cool niche, right? So wow. now a woman that the doctor said, you can't give birth in a birth center because you have type two diabetes. Now she has this doula that understands her. And throughout her whole pregnancy, she's listening to podcasts and reading content from this doula to understand how to manage her blood sugars. So I think that's one of the biggest yeah, things. Yeah, and see, that's and, interesting. Yeah there when you're talking about you know um women that birth practitioners putting out things like social media so mm -hmm. you know um and and that gets that's can be taking everybody way out of this their social their their comfort zone and then on top of that it's kind of like well you could spend all this time doing all this media but you know you've got 10 followers so it's yeah <laughs> and I that's know. again where birth circle can just make life a lot yep don't get buried in easier. social media. But I just say, if you have 10 followers and they're all paying customers, score. So I'd say stop worrying about the follower account. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing because most of us are not Instagram princesses and never will be TikTok princesses. So let's just write stuff, create stuff, comment on stuff that matters most to us. And people that feel that vibration, that need our vibration will be attracted to us. And don't worry so much. Like the birth world, that's the thing is, is a birth worker comes in and goes, I'm going to change the world, but they can't do it alone. It takes a community. So if everyone is just taking care of their own niches and taking care of their little special spot in the birth world, then everyone gets covered. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. And those and rural midwives, that, um, we need to get help for them. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use our overused word. I think that's quite empowering. <laughs> yeah, it's quite empowering. <laughs> We're allowed to use it. Yeah, it's kind of like saying that it's, you know, because we are taught to be able to, um, you know, that we should be able to, to adapt ourselves to all different kinds of mothers. Of course, yep. we should, you know. But amongst that, if you kind of say, look, it's all right to decide that you want to specialize. And um, if you do specialize, then uh, you're going to attract more of those and of whatever that is, of that specialty. I think that we already do have, um, we definitely have um, midwives and doulas um, that specialize in races, you know, like mm -hmm. we've got Chinese midwives looking after the Chinese community, et cetera, um, and Pacific Island midwives looking after the Pacific Island community. And that's fine. That's awesome. Um, but what you're saying is like, we can do other kinds of specialty that don't have to be necessarily race, which is an obvious one. It could be, as you say, that you're dealing with women who have gone through incredible infertility journeys or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's okay to kind of work out what's your real passion? What's the thing and that sometimes you're that isn't even actually done on purpose. One of my best friends mm -hmm. is a midwife and she's like, ah, most of my clients hemorrhage. She's like, I, my hemorrhage rate is out. I don't understand why all my clients hemorrhage. And, and I was like, well, I don't think it's the way you practice. I think it's actually the way that you, she actually just attracts women with higher risk. They're on the borderline of whether they should be home or mm -hmm. hospital. And because of the way she practices in her birth center, the way it's set up, she just attracts more of those people. So, so mm -hmm. that's accidentally her specialty is she's dang good at stopping a hemorrhage. <laughs> so she's like, I didn't mean to, you know, attract all these people. So some, so sometimes your specialty isn't like something you set out to do, but it like accidentally finds you. <laughs> yes, love that. So what do you sort of feel needs to really change around the, the birth industry itself, you know, to sort of correct some of the problems that are current out there? What, what do you think of those, those changes that do, do need to occur? Well, one thing, I don't know how this translates for New Zealand or any of the other English speaking countries so much um, in that we don't 
in the United States don't value birth professionals like we should and, and monetarily. We, the birth profession is not a well-paid profession. And so much like teachers, honestly, in the United States, mm -hmm. it's a very underpaid profession. Yeah, that's and what I hear. I would love, yeah. I would love to see mm -hmm. that changed. I don't necessarily want birth to be like Christmas or commercialized like weddings <laughs> or Christmas, but I, I do want to see uh, good professionals be paid what they're worth. And we do see that. There's a few midwives, especially here in Utah, that are demanding a, a higher price than anybody would have to pay for a deductible for a hospital birth. And they're always full because they are, they are um, really good at running their business, selling the emotion of an empowered birth and making sure that the, the woman has that experience that she wants. Um, so I would, that's one of the big changes I'd like to see the culture make. But then again, we're talking like, big picture. I can't, I can't bash any politician, force any politician into like creating minimum wage for midwives. I don't believe in that. I just believe in the industry together, coming together and saying, okay, you know what? I am a heart-based business, but I deserve to be paid like an architect. I deserve, some of our midwives have more schooling than hairdressers. Why, why are they yeah. paid more. Why are, you know, th 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 that's what I'm saying. And some of that has to come from within the community. So those with these heart calls, these, these passions need to sit with themselves and just say, am I sabotaging my own business success, my own ability to make change? Because I'm kind of, I kind of feel immoral in taking money for this heart calling that I have. Does that make sense? Nice. And it's not everybody. It's not everybody, but I just yes. see so it's many right, birth yeah. workers like feel almost like they shouldn't charge that this is an act of service that makes it unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we got to, and these people go coming out um, of the trainings and, and saying, I'll do my first five births for free. Knock it off. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> Just devalue you yourself. Yes. Yeah. And everybody else in the industry. So one of the um, you know, these there is such a tricky um balance with adhering to sort of that professional rather than commercial standards and making um and knowing the availability of your services. I mean, I know that for um not to harp on about New Zealand because this is an international um, webinar, but I, I know here it's like it's part of the codes of practice of a midwife is that you must um, make known the availability of your services in a professional rather than commercial standard. Um, and like that's so tricky. It's sort of like tying your arms behind your back. So yes, you can be self-employed and in business on your own. And yes, you can be responsible for generating your, your client base. Um, but you better might make it look like you're not a big business. It's kind of like, you, that's tricky. Yeah, yeah I mean, how do, mm -hmm. and you know, we won't be the only country that has that type of legislation for midwives. So, um, you know, how do they find that balance of being, you know, not coming across as being too commercial? That's a really interesting question. I kind of, um, my, my other business, I own a hotel. And so I'm very connected with the lodging industry. And I, I, I so I can kind of make a comparison here with Airbnb. So uh, Airbnb mm -hmm. makes innkeepers out of single people, like, like a single person could have a single rental and be an innkeeper mm -hmm. and on the platform the way you distinguish yourself as a professional listing versus you know bubba shed in the back is by just making sure that your that your content on your listing is clean your your photos are clean that you're speaking to exactly who you want to host that everything is is lovely but i don't think anybody would go to airbnb and say oh, well, they're just the new Marriott. They're just, because it's still so individualized. Every listing on there is very different. So as a birth community, if we can raise the standard, but Airbnb has raised the standard of lodging, has completely yes, revolutionized. I mean, everybody yeah. expects kitchenettes in all of their units now because of what Airbnb has done, right? You expect an entire yeah. suite with a kitchen. So now hotels are like scrambling to put kitchenettes in, right? So if we can kind of make the air, make the birth industry Kind of like what Airbnb is, is just aggregate all the independent birth workers and allow them to shine for who they are. They can be professional, but not in people's mind being like, oh, this is just another version of the establishment. 
right? <laughs> Actually, that that gives me that reminds me of something of a conference that um, I was uh, helping to organise, and uh, the conference manager went on to one of the sites um, where midwives list themselves, and uh, she was nothing to do with the industry. She was a conference and you know event organiser. And she was like, oh, my God, she said, you know, we, what we need to have at this conference is we need to have a professional photographer who can take portrait photos of these, like the standard of the photos of the midwife herself that she's putting out right? as her representation. She goes, oh, my God, like the standard's so low. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't even thought of that, but that was that outside view looking in. And, and you know, if you are particularly, a, you know, a, you're a, a woman who's realized that you're newly pregnant and you're uh, been at university and you've got a, a you know, a, 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 a nice senior role and then you go on and you look at these photos of these midwives. <laughs> you, think, you are not oh, wrong. No? <laughs> that, that's <laughs> a good point. The, that's a good point. And when I got my start in with our hotel, I started in 2008 before Airbnb really got big and I was on Craigslist. Do you have Craigslist in New Zealand? No, no, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what stood us apart, what really made us shine was I put photography first from the beginning. It's really, really important. And now wow, when I counsel with birth workers, when I mentor birth workers, I encourage them to do videos, video intros, and it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be super scripted or fancy. You can go on birth circle and see lots of them, um, but it just needs to be, uh, so you're, expressing your passion, who you serve and welcoming them into your space. And you know that you can make a snap judgment on someone within the first 10 seconds of them talking, whether you like them or not. And if you listen to a minute of them, you can either feel a connection or not. Right. So now I mean, that, videos, even that itself is such a simple yeah, evolutionary well, videos idea. Videos are taking the yeah. place of photos in a lot of yeah. marketing and, and just imagery. So I'd say if you're starting out, yeah, make sure that your website, your photos are snap on this is not a fourth of july picnic snapshot that you took that now that's your headshot go get a real professional headshot get um ask a photographer that's taking pictures at one of your births to give you to create some photos just for you of you you know making records or you using the doppler or whatever it is get some photos of you working um because that really shows your potential clients uh you're, I don't know. Well, I love the idea of just putting a video up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so Indeed. many um, practices, you know, midwifery and doula practices will have their own, you know, uh, website with four or six different uh, practitioners working there. And they, it's all just photos. Why not videos? You know, it can only be 30 seconds long. I think it's a great, it's, so, it's such, just such a simple idea. Okay. Yeah. So if you had the ear of everyone in the birth community, what is the first thing you would tell them that needs to be done to start making the actual changes that need to happen? Oh, okay. The first thing I'd say is um, go to this webinar I recorded with Kathy Frey one time. Listen to it. <laughs> it's only 45 minutes long, but that's where you get started. I just, wow, wow. I mean, we, yeah. we are, we are in the, the cusp of that revolution. Like, this is this is the 2008 when Airbnb was founded for hotel lodging business. We are 2020, 2021. Things we are at a tipping point in the birth industry all over the world, and all we have to do is <laughs> just understand what what our purpose, what our united goal is, mm -hmm. and find the resources. There is no excuse to say, well, I didn't know because we've got the internet, we've got birth circle, we've got IMCO, we've got all of these organizations that are uniting the birth community. There's no excuse to fail. Really. If you want to be a birth worker, there's no reason that you can't just make this your life's work. Wow. I love that. It's really inspiring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from it makes you want to be a birth worker, huh, Kathy? Weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, from a business perspective, how do you recommend that birth workers get past the feelings of that guilt um, about earning money from their work? You know, and it's funny because I have, and that's not just unique to birth workers. Um, my husband's a carpenter, 
and um, he hates doing quotes. He'd prefer to do charge ups, um, but he hates doing quotes because he knows he has to build in for the unforeseeable, which is not dissimilar to birth workers. Um, that, you know, is this going to be a quick labor? Is this mm. going to be a long labor? You don't know. You're going to have to kind of build in for the unforeseeable. Um, and he, he hates to do that because he feels like he's potentially ripping somebody off. And also, he has an issue with the fact that something that's so easy for him to do you know it could be something like I just know change right a handle on a door right and to him that like I could do that in my sleep but for somebody else that's it's a big thing to have somebody take that job over yeah. and do it and do it properly yeah and um so it's that feeling that you're uncomfortable charging somebody for something is not unique to the birth industry nope um nope but I think that we are one of the industries that are really notoriously terrible at wanting to charge because we're all so passionate. Well, I want to I wanna just give a little bit of coaching on pricing strategy for birth workers. Um, because you're right, it's not just birth, it's not just the birth industry that has a hard time with this, but but we have a unique way of, I don't know, hacking it. Um, mm -hmm. And I um, okay, so for example, I started my career as a birth filmmaker, and as a uh, word caught that I would do these gorgeous films, um, I got called to more and more births, and I started seeing things that I really wasn't okay. First of all, I'd be called to 40-hour births, and I don't, I don't shoot with a backup, um, and so 40 hours is really, really hard, obviously. Yeah. Um, I was being called a very, very far distances. I think the longest I traveled was 150 miles, um, and that's mm -hmm. just too far. Yeah. And I was being called to hospital births that I had, I had very traumatic hospital births. I think I'd be okay in the hospital now, but I, as a filmmaker, you have zero say in what goes on. I mean, even less than a doula, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like the, you're the bottom of the pecking order. And the first person to get ousted, if something goes wrong is the filmmaker. And so I was witnessing um, too many things that I just wasn't okay with. And I had, uh, we call it, um, um, birth per, birth provider trauma i was i was suffering secondary trauma watching these women be traumatized and so mm -hmm. i said okay i can't just say i only do home births because that's dumb because but what right. i did was i created a pricing structure first of all when you're doing your pricing make the put um put the highest price you would dare charge someone okay all right and then double it Okay, just put it down. Just write that number down. It's a little, little scary. We'll work backwards from that number, but it's a little bit scary. Okay, so then, so I wrote down a big, big fat number and I was like, okay, this is what I would do for a 40 hour hospital birth where I have to watch awful things. Okay, this is what I would charge. This would make that blood money worth it. I'm sorry, <laughs> not to be like, there's a lot of energy pent up in the births, right? Yeah. And, and then I worked backwards and I said, but if you use my superstar list, I call them superstars because I wanted to show my, my commitment to uh, my community. And I basically said, if you're using this person as a midwife, minus $400, well, she is only a birth center and home birth midwife. So, and how does that make her clients feel when they call me, right? Because I love working this midwife. I know that if they use this midwife, they're going to have a rockin' birth. So $400 discount if you use this midwife. Another $200 if you've taken any type of birth uh, education class. Because I know if you've taken a birth class from... Actually, I, I do specify certain teachers and modalities. If you've taken yeah. that, then I'm less likely to be traumatized by watching your birth, okay? Let's just be honest, right? Yeah. And then if you use... So I basically discounted that big, ugly price all the way down to where I was comfortable being. And when I did that, I did that about four or five years ago. Um, I have not had any type of birth trauma, <laughs> secondary trauma. I, the births I attend, some of them are, I mean, there's a difference between tr being traumatized and watching a hard birth. Like there are some yes. scary things that happen at births. I had uh, one baby that was, I've never had my footage subpoenaed, but I've gotten close twice where they take my footage to prove they were trying to prove that the midwife hurt somebody. And anyway, mm -hmm. So there's scary things that happen, but there's a difference between trauma and just stuff that happens, right? And we, as yeah. birth workers, know the difference. So if you're a midwife or a doula, do the same type of thing. Um, start, so, so for example, like a doula, just starting out, um, instead of lowering her price and saying, I'll do $300 birth, 
go to somebody like me. I'll do this for doulas, the brand new doulas. I'll say, you are worth 1500. This is just in our price, our area, whatever, just substitute whatever number, but you're worth this much. Okay. But you feel like you should do it for free, but that's my package price. So how about if you go out your first client, offer them, they hire you, they'll get a free video, right? Then you pay me for the video for my time and you keep the rest. You've not degraded your pricing strategy and you've given a ton of value to your client. Plus, I'm, Excellent. I'm a trained doula. I have your back. If you like deer in the headlights at a birth, I can help you. Like I'll, I'll like whisper in your ear what to do next, right? And and they're like, so go to another doula and do the same thing. Saying I'm a, a, a brand new doula. Can I pay you half of your package price to come shadow me? So now the mom gets two doulas for the price of one. And you're not degrading your price. And then you build the, the reputation for being a rock solid. I take care of my clients no matter what. I even bring a backup, right? Nice. So same with midwives. You can really start with thinking big outside package. the square. Yeah, you can yeah. You start with this big package and you work in other things like uh, placenta encapsulation on the market uh, wholesale. You can get it around here for about 150. That's somebody that you just go, you know, like you have a connection, but they're regularly going for two to 400. So build that into your package. Add an extra, uh, add an extra little bit, uh, two hundred to your package, and then the client gets the value of a four hundred dollar placenta encapsulation. But you are taking the placenta. My husband's like, "Don't bring any more placentas home. Don't do that anymore." <laughs> but you can be the service provider that takes that placenta and gives it to the encapsulationist yes. and brings it back on your follow up appointment. So look for ways to bring more value to your customer that doesn't degrade your your price structure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or as you say, you could be hiring tens of machines or you could be um, hiring the pools or, um, yeah, it's just thinking outside the square and making yourself, um, you know, some giving even better service. Yeah. Because um, really, at the end good. of the day, what do you want? At the end of yeah. the day, you want your client to be loved on. You want your client to be safe, happy and satisfied, right? And healthy. So just build your pricing structure to make sure that that happens and make sure that you're cared for as well. And everybody, everybody wins. Love it. Okay. So um, what part do you hope to have um, birth circle sort of play um, in changing birth for everyone involved? We, we, yeah. Let's go because we started with birth circle. So let's kind of ha, do a circle back to it. Um, and because I know that what you're doing with Birth Circle, you know, we, you and I have had big, long conversations mm -hmm. on it. And so I want you to share some of that because it's amazing, exciting stuff that you've got. And Yeah. Like I said, we're on the cusp <laughs> of this revolution and our, our birth world all over the world is just, we're just ripe for innovation, right? Just things are changing so fast and we have zero excuse, especially like this is one of the things I think COVID has blessed the birth world. There's a lot of awful things it's done. We can undo those. We can fix those. But one of the beautiful things it's done is, is it's driven more people online for resources mm. and it has widened the scope, the reach of birth workers who have followings and you develop a following by niching down. We talked about that earlier. So, so now if you are a, di a diabetic doula, or if you are um, a trauma doula or anything, you can help people in places that are not your area, get the resources that they need. So somebody says, oh, wow, Salt Lake has a diabetic doula. I wonder if there's one here in Nebraska. Or I wonder if there's one here in New Zealand. So then they Google diabetic doula. And so then what Birth Circle is trying to do is help every independent birth worker aggregate their resources. So instead of like pounding away at Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and being buried constantly with, and just yeah. having to create new content all the time, they put it on birth circle. It lives forever. It never gets degraded. So you write an article about having, um, having given birth or how to manage blood sugars in birth. Um, you write that three years ago, somebody in New Zealand um, looks up diabetes and pregnancy and they find your article, they find you, they click on you, they see who you recommend or what you recommend to do. If they're close enough, they call you and hire you. That's what we hope to provide for the birth community is yeah, that I remember you to aggregate. Yeah, I remember you saying once that, that your vision is basically that birth circle is going to become like the Airbnb for mm -hmm. accommodation. That With 
with a small difference, okay? Yeah. So Airbnb is merely a directory. It connects buyer with seller and that is all it does. Right. With their circle, we take a more active approach in, in making sure that our sellers actually succeed. So the birth circle portal has business tools, contracts, um, billing strategies, websites. We Right now we're offering, well, the, I don't know how long this is going to live, but we're offering a deal on websites. We'll build a website for you, for the birth circle, for you separately, but also on the birth circle platform. We have writing services, social media services, video services. So you could come get all of this created and it lives and it, you own it. It lives for you. So that's, that's a difference between just a directory. We don't just want to connect people. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that people really get what they need to make that connection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody um, uh, is, yeah, so tell, tell me the sort of the process of somebody thinking, okay, maybe I should, you know, create a profile on birth circle or sort of what's the process? How does it, how does it work? Yeah. So you just go sign up. Um, right now we're still very small. Um, we have, we have um, I, um, active profiles. We have, I think about 5,000, there's um, about 50,000 independent birth workers in the United States. So we are just hitting steam. You can sign in, you can create a listing that um, is very, very specific, like an Airbnb listing, right? You can start gathering reviews. You can post photos, videos of yourself. You can start writing articles. So things that are submitted to the first- And also it would mean that, um, say for example, when you- um, I don't know, when you've got a signature at the bottom of your email, you could include your a link to your mm -hmm. profile on birth circle. Yep. Ideally, so, so that's the other thing is that if there's 50,000 birth workers with 50,000 different websites, that's a little much for people to like try and nav navigate. Every website's a little different. Yeah. Where's the menu? And then those of us who can't even program a website, we're at a disadvantage to somebody mm. who has money, money. So birth circle kind of levels the playing field that way too, is that you can come on the platform and you can see the portfolios and, and profiles of all these different birth workers in a format that's easy to find the right worker, find the right midwife or whatever you're looking for. Yeah. And we're also, um, I mean, another area that we, we jointly have sort of plans with mm -hmm. is the, is creating it so that it's not just the birth workers, but it's also those that are involved in maternity care. So yes. it could be the acupuncturist who specializes in maternity or the medical herbalist that specializes in infertility or, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, and we're working and, with other companies like Imco to integrate what you yeah. have. Um, you're working on an Imco uh, certification or a badge that we can we that uh, providers can put on their birth circle profiles to show yeah. that they are connected to this network. So we're working with uh, professional um, professional certification bodies to get accreditation, kind of badges on these providers so it's really easy to kind of see what type of provider somebody is or or you know just so you know yeah. when you're going really into for it to end up being um the global leader of this directory of or beyond mm -hmm. just directory but um so that you know if you it doesn't matter if you're in australia um or um canada or Utah, you and and then you have to shift. You'd go, oh well, I'll look it up on Birth Circle. You know, mm -hmm. if you've moved city and you want to look, find out another midwife who's got that kind of way of thinking or, or whatever, you'd be able to go to that directory because at the moment it is such a hodgepodge um, yes. internationally. You know, it's a, now in New Zealand we do happen to have a website that has um, all the independent midwives on it, which is very helpful, which the College of Midwives put together, but. Um, you know, it's sort of taking that to a, a bigger scale. Um, and it's it's very exciting. I hope that um, all of you watching today is a, a kind of inspired by Sarah because she's just, you've just experienced the tip of the iceberg of her today and all her amazing ideas. Well, we have the best so industry good. in the world. I mean, don't tell everybody else. We're like, we're in the, this is the secret sauce to happiness right here. It's the birth <laughs> world, right? <laughs> She's just brilliant. So look, we're going to be winding up soon, but um, if anybody has any questions, do sort of type that through to the Q&A. Um, and I think it's it's like, it, it's so important that we, 
give ourselves permission to remember that we are business people at the same time as being holistic carers. Um, you know, and when you look at the likes of those really big names that people know, you know, the Dr. Phil and the Dr. Oz and those sorts mm -hmm. of things, you know, nobody could say that they are not passionate and committed about the work that they do, even though they happen to be making very good money at the same time. You know, you, you can't, you, there is a kind of can have it all type of feeling, but and not feeling that you're ripping people off or it's, yeah. We're all just, we wear our heart on our sleeves in this industry. Yes, we do. Yes, <laughs> we do. We do. So look, is there anything um, that we haven't covered off that you'd like to finish up with today? No, I think we were really complete, but I'd love to hear if there, if there are any questions from anybody. Um, yeah, please pipe up. I'd love to hear, especially since looks like most of you are not in, oh, Central Florida. Ha, hi. United States. <laughs> it's like a lot of people are not here in the United States. So what do you think? What, what are the things that your birth communities are struggling with that you see in your pockets, in your areas? Can they actually unmute yeah, themselves? And I know that. Yeah. See, in, um, in New Zealand, it has that there's like a set fee that um, independent midwives receive. Um, so it's quite sort of tricky there and but you know every country has um, there needs to be a an ability to um, know that there's more strings to your bows and you know that you can there are more services that you could be working with and collaborating yeah. with and I love yeah. the idea of the um, I, I loved your idea of the doula throwing in a free you, a free filmmaker, you know, and that or a free breastfeeding course or a free massage yes. or it's just something to build to build the community because yeah. you just want to build that support around your client. Um, and also, if you're listening now or in the future, if you do have any questions or want support with your birth business, reach out to us. Our email is media at birthcircle.com. That's, the, that's the, the department that handles all the website creation. And mm -hmm. like I said, we can do websites for you. And, and the cool thing about building through Birth Circle is, A, we're dirt cheap because the birth workers, you need that like investment money is precious, right? And mm -hmm. the set, well, we're very affordable. Um, the thing is we get birth. We know what yeah. your challenges are and we are not gonna just build you a website like the, the landscaping company we just finished or the contractor we just finished. We only mm -hmm. build birth websites. And so mm -hmm. we want to make yours stand out, uniquely yours with video, articles, social media, memes, posts, photos that really represent you, colors, logos, everything, you, so that your ideal client, the, the women that you are supposed to help will be attractive to you. Oh, that is just awesome. We, um, I'm just reading somebody here. We, we have two hospitals. rural hospitals, midwives not allowed, high rate of teen pregnancy and substance abused, uh, substance exposed newborns. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so that, that's, that's a challenge. Mm. I don't, I don't know the circumstance, but her, perhaps there's a way that um, there could be program because in, in the, in the case of teen pregnancy, the customer is not the teenager. It's the mom or the dad of the teenager, right. Or the school system that's having to deal with these teenage moms. So if there are, there are programs you can develop um, Maybe, maybe you make a promise. <laughs> maybe, maybe your program is helping teen, mom, teen moms figure out what they're going to do with the pregnancy, with the baby, adoption, parenting, whatever. Maybe your program is a guidance program set up to come into the home and you market to the moms and dads who are distressed about this, distressed that their, their daughter is on substances and is exposing their grandchild to to these things and maybe there's a program that can be developed um maybe there's again the the midwife or the doula example i gave before maybe you set up a program that trains doulas and you get a grant that um that pays for your services and these doulas especially substance abuse trained doulas go into the births with these moms and help them because again birth is an incredible opening to healing and yeah. even if you're drug exposed, even if you're high when you're in birth, if you are treated beautifully, if you are treated safely, 
there's a great chance that, well, for sure that imprints on, on the girl, on the woman, right? Yeah, but yeah. you are contributing to her healing or her options to heal, right? So there's lots of cool opportunities. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of when, um, that when, when I have young clients um, and I will, one of the first things I say to them is, I just want you to know that I'm never going to refer to you as a young mother your mother and I'll say you know up to you know 100 years ago and beyond or the thousand of years before that you weren't young you were a normal normal age to be having a baby mm -hmm. you're just young today but I'm not going to call you that and as soon as they you know, know that they're feeling like ah oh, okay she respects me <laughs> I love that so much yeah so maybe your program is helping the moms of these teenagers reframe their language yeah. so that the teenager feels more empowered yeah yeah so even that you i just loved how you know we hear somebody typed a, a little you know challenge in the area um and you've just turned that around and gone well this is what you could do with that you know so many opportunities um, and that is what sarah is so jolly good at which is why we call her a serial entrepreneur she just sees the opportunity where everybody else sees challenges um, but look, we're going to have to wind it up there. And look, thanks so much, Sarah. And um, yeah, and everybody that uh, turns up because of course, you know, if um, if we didn't have an audience out there, we'd, we'd be feeling like we're just talking to nothingness. And um, so thanks for uh, attending our webinars. And, and we get fantastic feedback on them. And so, and I think we're fully booked with presenters up till May next year. So, um, and it's currently December. So, so that's pretty exciting. And um, that's great. So th th thank you everybody. And thank yeah, you so much, Sarah, you. I love you. Thank you so much. Mwah. Mwah. Okay, bye everybody.